Welcome to the Bee Ninjas podcast, where you get an all-access pass to see what happens behind the closed doors of a fast-growing global bookkeeping and financial reporting business. episode of the Bean Ninjas podcast, I am joined again by Meryl Johnston, CEO and co-founder of Bean Ninjas, and we're going to talk about the breakup, which sounds really dramatic and a little bit crazy, but you know, when a lot of companies lose a founding member of their team, it is dramatic and a little bit crazy, but for Bean Ninjas, it didn't go that way. And there are some really specific reasons why when Ben left the company and Meryl bought him out, it went really well to the point where uh, Meryl and Ben are still collaborating on some other things today. And we'll talk about that as well. With regard to their breakup and Ben leaving the company, Meryl talks to me about the signs that a change was coming, uh, how she decided to finally have some difficult conversations, what it took to get through the negotiation process. So when you're buying out your partner, there's a lot of negotiation that goes on and plenty of room for some discord in the midst of that. They avoided all of that and she's going to tell me how. Uh, And then she's even going to talk a little bit about breaking the news to her team and the way that she and Ben did it, which is actually really beautiful and thoughtful and says a lot about how they think of the team members that work for them every day. And then we close the episode with a discussion about creating a transition that benefits everyone on your team. So it's a really useful conversation. It's really interesting and very, very forthright and transparent, which I think is a little unusual. Uh, You don't hear too many founders that will tell you all of the inside, uh, what was going on behind the curtain, so to speak. And Meryl does that with me. So let's not waste any more time. Let's jump right into the Bean Ninjas podcast. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am your co-host, Elizabeth Powers. I'm joined once again by Meryl Johnston, co-founder of Bean Ninjas. Meryl, how are you? I'm good, thanks. It's been an interesting week. The surf has been really good on the Gold Coast, but also it's coming up to the Australian end of financial year. So Ah. it's, I'm I'm torn whether I should be out (laughs) making the most of the good surf. And we've got a lot of work to do at Bean Ninjas preparing for the Australian end of financial year. Yes, that you know, that's tough. It's kind of like, you know, am I going to feed my soul or feed my bank account? Which one can you choose? Now, tell me a little bit about your surfing. Um, are you, and I don't know that much about surfing, even though I'm from Florida. I should know. I don't know that much. Um, are you kind of like a longboard surfer? Do you use the small boards? What is your surf style and preferences? So I'm, I am a short boarder, but I actually have a longboard too. So nice. usually in the morning... When I get up and go and check the surf, I take both boards if I know that it's not going to, it may or may not be big enough for my short board. So mainly I just love getting out in the water. Got it. Whatever, whatever it is. And I actually have some time in my calendar schedule. I try to have less meetings or no meetings if possible on Mondays and Fridays. So if the surf is good, then I, I still have work that I need to do, but it doesn't have a timeline and it's not meetings with other people. So I can fit that in around when the surf is going to be good. That is awesome. That's one of those benefits of being an entrepreneur and starting your own company. Now, you must live relatively close to the beach, or are you, like, driving 30 minutes to get there every day? No, I'm very close. Awesome. Five, where I am at the moment is about 500 metres to the beach and a local surf spot that I love surfing. Perfect. Yeah. So you're in the right spot. And now I just have to ask, I know it's a ridiculous question. This is how analytical my brain is. How are you getting two boards onto the beach by yourself at like, what, 5 a.m., 6 a.m.? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I get to the surf spot and then I check the surf. And then based on what I can see the waves look like, I know the right kind of board to surf. And then I only take one down. That makes so much more sense than what was happening in my head when you first said that. (laughs) Clearly, you're the experienced surfer here. Now, so you said you're coming into the Australian tax year. I'm uh, in the U.S., so we have a different schedule than yours. So how it's it's starting this week. So you're busy getting everything ready for all of your clients, right? 
That's right. So we do preparation internally at Big Ninjas just because we know that the next two months are going to be it's a really busy time for us, sure. as well as the June quarter ending, which is when we prepare all of the business activity statements for sales tax GST. We also have in a financial year work and some payroll compliance work to do in quite a tight timeline. So we've we've actually done this week is busy, but we've actually started the planning about a month ago where we map out who's doing what, when, to make sure that we can hit all of the different deadlines over the next couple of months. Wow. So so starting starting your busy season a little bit. And I should mention, too, for you, it's, what, 5 a.m. right now as we're recording? That's right. So not only is it tax season, you're, you're struggling to give up your surf time for the tax season, but also for me. So thank you for joining me. <laughs> it's a big <laughs> sacrifice. <laughs> it's difficult to find a quiet time. Our office on the Gold Coast, the Beanies' office, is above a brewery, so there's noises related to brewing and trucks coming in and out. Sure. So it's 5 a.m. I'm guaranteed for there to be no background noise. Wow. Definitely you have all of the DNA to be an entrepreneur because you are up and making coherent ser- sentences at 5 a.m., which is better than I'm doing at 3 p.m. my time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk about the breakup, which is not a topic you hear very many entrepreneurs talking about, even when they have been through a breakup. And we're talking, of course, about the breakup of a partnership. So you started Bean Ninjas with a partner at the helm with you, sort of equal partners. We talked in the last couple of episodes, and, and if for anyone listening, if you missed the last couple of episodes, you want to go back and hear those really valuable insights from Meryl about the seven-day launch, which she accomplished. It's amazing. She gives you some really good information on how you can do that if you are an entrepreneur looking to start your business in the future. And then the second episode, we went through your first eight months after the launch happened. Your first eight months, um, you and your co-founder at the time, Ben, um, had the success that you had, the processes and procedures that you built, which was really, really good information. Um, and you talked about the value of those processes and procedures. So if you missed those, go back and listen to the first two episodes. And now we're going to talk about the breakup, but there's a little space between episode two and this episode, which is three, that I want to talk about, and that is between months eight and 12. I want to get just a quick insight from you on what was going on in in that space of time. Yeah, so we were really in a good space at the eight-month mark when we had achieved, we'd grown the business to $100,000 of revenue, and that was one of the first milestones that we were aiming for. So we were in a really good place when we hit that milestone and feeling motivated. And also we had some more money coming into the bank because revenue had grown and we were reinvesting that money back into the team and into improving things like our systems. And hitting that level of revenue also started to create a snowball effect. So we had a bigger client portfolio and that then meant that we were focused on doing good work and that they were telling, our clients were telling friends and family and we were starting to get some momentum and we really started to grow. So I think getting to 100,000 was a tipping point. And then we, over the next period of months, we really focused on growth and looking at a graph, our, our growth curve was looking good. And we had also split roles within the business. So at the beginning, Ben and I had quite, well, we had very similar skill sets. And so we were doing everything, both of us. We were both doing sales calls, both both doing the bookkeeping, overseeing oh. bookkeeping work, both writing blog posts. We were doing everything. Mm-hmm. And we had figured out around that time that we actually should separate our roles. And I was focused on business development and Ben was focused on running the team. And I was loving that role too in building relationships, doing content marketing and really just focusing on growth. Sure. And so that was what, what had been happening from from that eight-month mark, and, and then we really hit that growth point. And that's kind of a big shift, too. So you were kind of divvying up the exact same tasks between the two of you, and then at that point you decided one of you needed to do all of, of a certain set of tasks and the other should do all of another set of tasks. Tell me a little bit about 
kind of how that, I mean, I know you said that you were loving um, some of the business development. Do you think that before we get to really kind of going too deep into the breakup, but do you think that kind of started um, causing some problems? Because it, it, it sounds to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, it sounds to me a little bit like, hey, we're going to hire you for um, a receptionist job. Oh, well, now we want you to go and do some bookkeeping. Like, you know, you can kind of take someone out of their element to the point where now they're a little bit lost. Did that happen at all when you guys sort of segmented those tasks? I think we we had a task list of all of the tasks to do in the business, and then we tried to play to our strengths. And so Ben had some real strength. He's a smart guy, and he also is a very logical thinker and good with he can do a bit of programming in here we had a, a lot of overlapping skills and then some differences and i liked being um i was enjoying the networking side of things more so i think we kind of naturally gravitated to the the areas that we wanted to focus on mm-hmm. but then there's some tasks that no one really enjoys doing but we we, <laughs> we we were pretty we're always quite fair with each other so we tried to divide that up so we each had a combination of tasks that played to our strengths and then also um, share some of the tasks that neither of us really wanted to do. And then we tried to group the tasks into roles as well. So everything related to marketing instead of one person writing content and then someone else attending or building relationships and doing the networking. Gotcha. And, and I mean, it really, it was us doing everything apart from we had bookkeepers doing some of the bookkeeping work, but everything else, HR, marketing, our internal accounting, legal, everything else. When you're a small business, you you have that, all of those different hats on. Sure. But, and I think we, it was actually better once we did split those roles because otherwise there was so much, so much backwards and forwards trying, trying to figure out who was doing what. So I think that was actually a positive thing, but I think it was just the sheer volume of new clients that they were coming in when our processes were still fairly new, that that was what was putting us under pressure. Right. And so, you know, that... that brings me to the point that I still am kind of blown away by, which is you were both still working sort of other jobs, both, I think you both had consulting businesses of some sort going on outside of being ninjas, but because you, you, you know, obviously had your own lives to support and you were waiting for being ninjas to grow to a point where, you know, it could pay you a salary that you were both comfortable with, you were still doing other businesses, right? You and Ben. We both were. I had a consulting business where I was doing accounting systems project work and Ben had a tax practice. And it was a real challenge because we could see that Bean Ninjas had much greater growth potential than either of our consulting businesses, but it also was not earning, because we were hiring other people to do the bookkeeping work and we were investing in systems, it wasn't paying us. We weren't earning what we could in our own consulting businesses. And we both had living costs that we needed to cover while we were going through this growth phase, as well as there only being a a certain number of hours every week and trying to get that balance between earning enough money in the consulting business and then doing the fun work, which was growing bean ninjas, trying to get that balance right was very difficult for both of us. Absolutely. Well, I want to get now because we're kind of starting to cover some of the um, the points that I want to talk about. Um, so let's dive into the story of the breakup. So you and Ben went through your seven day launch. You started the company together. And then I think it was right around the one year mark, you separated the partnership. So you had this breakup of a partnership. Uh, ben decided that it was in his best interest to leave being ninjas and you decided to buy him out i want to go through even all the way back to the earliest sort of signs that this was coming even if you didn't see them at that point in time um what were the earliest signs that the partnership was beginning to struggle i think some of the decisions that we were making about investing back into the business or hiring staff and I think we had quite different family situations and Ben had a wife and a two-year-old daughter at the time. So he was under more pressure in terms of what he needed to provide for his family, but also commitment with his time as well, needed, wanting to be a good father, which, which I really admired. And I was in a different position with not having, not, I didn't have a, a child and didn't have financial pressure 
And so I was wanting to grow the business and reinvest and even put money into the business to potentially help us grow or work longer hours. And because we were coming out decisions from different places, it meant that decisions around things like investing in something in the business or hiring someone or having a manager in the business, we were coming to different decisions around things like that. Mm -hmm. And so when you started to realize that you were kind of approaching things a little bit differently, so, you know, we talked a minute ago about you had kind of divided some of the tasks and then you both got to work on your individual tasks. And then there was this realization that you're approaching things a little bit differently. You're starting to see that there's a difference between the two of you. How does it go from, because I'm sure that happens with every partnership, um, you know, whether it's a startup company or, you know, someone coming along to work closely under a CEO, you know, there's got to be times when you're like, okay, we're seeing this differently. You want to go or handle that or attack this problem from a different perspective than I do. And some people survive that. Some people don't. What do you think were sort of the defining differences that led you to breaking up the partnership versus just kind of, you know, dealing with it and, and moving forward? I think if it's a difference around an aspect of the business, so if it was I was running marketing and if it was a decision around marketing, then Ben would let me make that with with input. And the same, if I had something around running the operations of the business, then that's his area of the business and I'd let him run that. But these were some more fundamental foundations around where we wanted to take the business now and in the next few months, but also over the next couple of years. Mm. And and we were very different in that position. But I think what forced the decision to be made faster was that because we were growing so quickly, we had a lot of new clients coming in and that was really putting pressure on our systems and on out on our team. And we had a couple of clients, this was a while ago now, but we had some clients that weren't getting as good experience as they probably could because we were under this pressure. And that was where it felt like, well, we've got to, we've got to make some changes. We either need to we need to invest in our systems, we need to hire different people, that we have to make some changes. And I think that's what sped up this conversation for us to then see, well, we're not really coming at this. We have different goals and different visions and it doesn't seem like we can really get through this because we want different things. And I should mention, too, um, that Ben has also been very forthright and honest. And I think at, at one point, even after... Um, ending the partnership you two did some interviews together and you both spoke very candidly so um i think even just that is a really big clue for those of us who wonder how does that happen and then you maintain a friendship and how do you make this happen without there being big issues and problems and drama you know both of you respected your friendship and one another enough to go through this whole process and make the decisions you had to make um you know, with maturity and honesty and, and forthrightness and, and owning anything you needed to own in it. And even after the fact, you continued to kind of partner, even if it was just in an interview about the partnership. So I, I should mention that because I certainly think that that's to be applauded and it's unfortunately rare, but it makes a big difference when you start your partnership with someone that can even go through the difficult times with the same level of respect that, that you started with. Um, and you did... Um, and I want to talk about, well, let me ask you this first. So let's talk about kind of the process. So you started to recognize and have conversations about the fact that the, you each saw the business going in a different direction. And Ben has previously mentioned uh, as well that as a husband and a father, you know, he had some priorities that had to come before, you know, working two jobs, you know, because again, you guys were both working in your own businesses and then working to grow Bean Ninjas as well. So you were both basically working full, two full-time jobs. And for a husband and a father, obviously his wife and his child have to come into consideration in that list of priorities. So he's mentioned before, you know, that that had a big part in his decision to ultimately um, end the partnership. What were the steps you took and how did you make sure that he always felt respected and appreciated and understood during that process? Yeah, it was a challenging time for both of us because it's quite an emotional thing with a 
it's not it's a business it is a, just a business someone could describe it but we, there's a lot of emotional emotions around that too and we were really proud of what we had been building with bean Ninjas, and we both really loved the business mm -hmm. so it was there was a lot of emotion around that too and it was challenging but we both have a lot of respect for each other and we did all during that period and now as well where as you said we did that podcast interview and i think we'll, we'll add a link to that in the show notes that's quite an interesting interview where we talk through some of that process as well but there's ben's perspective too not just mine mm -hmm. and we've actually we ran an event together on the gold coast earlier this year where we had 30 entrepreneurs Oh, nice. come to the Gold Coast and, and mastermind. So we're definitely still in touch and we still have a lot of respect for each other. And we still do do run things together because we like working together, but it just wasn't what we wanted with Bean Ninjas was different. And I think it was important. We both, it was really important to both of us because we did have a lot of respect for each other that we kept that throughout the process. And I think also I was lucky that, that Ben was a really honest, trustworthy guy and so we were able to work through, even though as I'd only met him in person once before we'd gone into the business, it all worked out well and he was a really decent guy. And I think the fact that we had mapped out a lot of what an exit would look like before we actually went into business together, and that was in our co-founder agreement about how we would handle a situation like this, we, we had something, we had some steps and a framework to follow. And we had some guidelines around how we would value the business and what the transaction would look like. And that really helped us through that phase as well, where we went from, okay, it's not working to what do we do about this? And then how do we actually, how do I buy them as part of the business? And then what happens after that? Right. Definitely the, the smartest thing that you all could have done. And I'm sure most co-founders have some sort of agreement, but whether it was, part of your agreement or not at this point in time if you were talking to an entrepreneur so let's say that there was a couple of co-founders or soon to be co-founders listening to the show what do you what would you recommend as some of the most important um pieces of that part of your agreement where okay let's look at it if for whatever reason in the future we decide to go our separate ways what do you think is the most important list of things they can include in that specific agreement so I think how so what would happen in a buyout situation? So would and what happens if especially if there's more than one co-founder? I was like it was just Ben and I, but what would happen if there was more than one co-founder or an outside party wanted to buy in? And so having things like um, drag I'm, I'm having a mental blank, but there's drag along clauses like that. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, we actually did have a valuation framework which in hindsight, we didn't really know that much about how you value an accounting business. And so it might be difficult to actually include the valuation method mm -hmm. when a business is very new, but it actually, that did help us. But in hindsight, it might actually be difficult to do that for other co-founders. And then also just thinking about, is it, do you have a company? So are you gonna be acquiring shares and, and how is that all gonna work? And also having a transition plan that wasn't actually in our co-founder agreement, but that was something that we talked about as part of this too. That was really important. It wasn't as though we did the transaction and Ben left the business the next day. We wanted to have a really smooth transition for everyone. Absolutely. So I wanna talk a little bit, um, you mentioned that you were not really sure initially when you, I mean, of course, before you start the business and for both of you, it was the first time that you were entering into a partnership like this. So I wanna talk a little bit about you know, you did your best when you were building your agreement to kind of figure out how you would evaluate the business if you got to the point of, of dissolving the partnership. How did you approach that when it came time for that to happen? So I'm sure you had somewhat of an idea that you kind of put, it, you know, in, into the agreement. What actually happened at that moment when you get, okay, you've, you've had the tough conversations, Ben is sure that this is the best thing for him, you're understanding, you've kept it amicable. Now you got to talk about valuating the company, buying him out, how much time it's going to take for you to get the resources you need to buy him out. How did you do that? Tell me about that conversation and how you were, how you managed to get through that and again, come out, you know, still friends. But that actually took a period of months where we figured out 
the, the valuation and how that process would actually work in terms of instalment payments and whether you had something like a callback clause. So there were that it wasn't something that we worked out just quickly. It took quite a lot of backwards and forwards of trying to think through things in terms of how we structured the agreement, what date were we going to do it, how would the payments look, and then how, what would the transition plan look like. And so we would just have regular calls and we were also working in some shared spreadsheets to on the valuation and then also on the transition plan. And Ben was very helpful with that too in terms of all of the steps and things that we needed to do. Mm-hmm. And it was really important that we sometimes when we were communicating by email about this, it, it felt it, we, we, things could be lost in translation. And so then we would always try and jump on a call to talk through things. And as soon as we were on a call together, we knew that we both cared about each other and we were trying to do the right thing by each other too. And so we could hear the perspective of why someone was suggesting this particular clause or why we were including something in, in a particular cal- calculation. And so I think that was important. If, if we'd done it all by email, then we it could have felt like the other person was trying to take advantage of us. And But when we were talking on the phone, we'd straight away realize again, no, we, we're both trying to do the right thing here. Right, because you're still living in different parts of Australia. So as much as you are partners and co-founders, you're in very different faraway locations from each other. And that was going to be my next question is, do you think in hindsight, had you been located in the same office, coming to work together in the same building every day, do you think that would have made a difference ultimately as to whether or not Ben stayed on as a partner? I think it it may may have. It's, It's hard to say. But it is definitely challenging when you're not in the same place. So if we had been showing up to the office together regularly, uh, it, it may have it may have made a difference. But then some of the underlying or the foundational issues that we had may not have been resolved by that. So I think spending time together in person is very valuable, and that's something we it's really important with the rest of our team too because we're spread out all around the world, and. So I think spending time together, may, it may have helped, but I don't know if it would have resolved the, the underlying issue, which was our different goals. You know, there are not, and I think I said this earlier in the episode, there are not too many entrepreneurs that are going to hop on a podcast and talk really transparently about something as difficult as, you know, your, your co-founder leaving the company. And I think it's valuable insight for everyone to hear because even if you're just the employee and there's, you know, some, some change in, in executive management, there seems to be this assumption that most of us, and I'm guilty of it too, where you think, oh, things must have gone bad, you know, uh, they must have had a fight. They don't like each other anymore. So there's always this sort of negative thing. And really in the end, your uh, partnership went the way it did and you decided to buy Ben out because he had some priorities that he had to put above the business, which is completely understandable and respectable. And you had a direction that you wanted to take the company in that he just couldn't go with you. Um, And so nothing for anyone to take personally, right? But especially as a female entrepreneur and now a female CEO, I think women are especially judged harshly if we show any emotion in the workplace. But this was your friend. You had worked together for many, many months at this point in time. I'm sure you had sort of a vision and a dream of where this company would go and that, you know, he would be your partner throughout it. Tell me a little bit, just kind of from a personal standpoint, the days when the emails felt a little negative and you were sort of scared about being alone at the helm. How did you manage your emotions during those days when you still had to show up to the office, serve your clients, work two jobs, keep everything going, stay positive, keep your team positive. And at this point, you guys weren't really sharing any of this information with your team, your employees. So you were also not really allowed to to show because people would wonder what in the world's going on. Why are you so upset? Tell me how you handled that. It, it was a pretty difficult time in the lead up to doing the, the buyout transaction with Ben. And I think I'd been feeling, I, probably both of us had been feeling a bit frustrated just because the it was overwhelming with the amount of new clients that we had and, and the business growth. And because of that, it felt difficult to approach the subject of the partnership not go, going so well. And so in one sense, I felt a sense of relief when we finally did 
get an opportunity to talk through the issues because it had been building up. But because we were so busy with work, we did, it felt difficult to have another difficult conversation. So that was a weight off our shoulders, I think, starting to have those conversations and really talk clearly about how we were feeling about certain things. But then it was also challenging just the, the whole emotions of having the conversations around things like the buyout as well as trying to do everything else. It was a, that was that was challenging. And a big transaction like that, it means a lot from a personal finance point of view too. So you really don't want to get things wrong. And so I was conscious of that and then feeling the pressure around making sure that I wasn't making a, a bad decision because it was quite a big decision. Sure. So I did try and keep exercising and doing things like surfing and, and yoga during that period. But again, some of that was starting to fall by the wayside too because I was just so busy, which also probably wasn't helping the way I was feeling. Sure. Yeah. Two full-time jobs, yoga and 5 a.m. surfing. I don't know of anyone that could keep up with that for very long. <laughs> <laughs> So we've gotten to the point now where you and Ben have had the tough conversations. You've spent months negotiating, you know, most of it via email. You've picked up the phone when it was necessary um, and continued those conversations, which I think kind of softened some of it to actually remember that this is your friend and you still feel um, respect for each other. So now you're to the point where you're you are closing the finalized paperwork to end the partnership. You're buying him out. At this point, Ben is still going to stay on for a few months, right? And what was his role going to be? What was his role uh, after you you uh, finalized the partnership uh, going by the wayside? So he was staying on as a consultant for a couple of months, just because he he was working in the business, and all well, a lot of that work was going to come to me, and so there just needed to be a transition period where he could hand different things over to me because I couldn't pick up all of his role overnight as well as my role sure. and the consulting work that I was doing. Come on, Meryl, so, why yeah. not? I don't get it. You don't need sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Ben actually flew up to the Gold Coast for us to finalise the transaction. And that's, I can actually remember us going to record a video for the team to let them know. We couldn't do it in person because everyone is spread out to record the team video letting them know what was happening and we went down to the beach early one morning so we had a beach background which we thought was quite fitting and then we nice. we made the announcement to the team and we thought it was important that we did it together so it showed that we were it, the whole decision had been made together and that Ben would still be around he had been managing staff too so we needed to be careful of that transition from now me as the new manager so it was actually, I'm really grateful that Ben could have just said no, but he he still wanted Ben just to do well. And so he was great during that period of making that transition smooth and transitioning clients across as well that, that he'd been managing. I think that shows so much care and concern, even just for your employees, as well as for your clients, that you both felt it was important to make that message, you know, to put it in a beautiful spot like the beach to come together and of course he had to hop a flight which I think was um, really kind of him but it just shows you know how much you both care about the business which is your employees and your clients I mean that's what your business is so I think it speaks volume just about the character that each of you have what was the response to that video um, did you show I'm assuming you showed it to your employees and and what what were they surprised were they all kind of sad did you have attrition anyone leave at that point we didn't have anyone leave at that point. I think people were surprised because we'd kept this very close to our chest because as leaders of the business, we wanted to make sure that we'd, we'd thought through everything and we had a clear plan before we actually shared it with the team. So I think from the outside, it, because we were always very respectful in things like meetings, I don't think anyone would have... No one mentioned that they had picked up on, on anything. And then I think because of the, the transition plan, we didn't have anyone leave uh, related to, to that. We did have staff changes, but that was more related to me making changes in the business once I took over from Ben, and that happened, That was a little bit further down the track. Sure, absolutely. Um, and then, it, as I remember, it happened that sort of right around the time that Ben left and you're kind of on your own at the helm for the first time. Uh, you are the one and only person in charge. The business goes, you have some struggles within the business. Tell me a little bit about that rough patch and how you were able to handle it alone. 
So I thought I'd got through the difficult. I thought that the difficult period was going to be do doing the transaction with Ben. But actually, the three or four months after that were also quite difficult. So it was quite, it was quite a long period of <laughs> difficult work and, and high emotions. So once Ben left, once we went through the transition period and then he left the business, then it was it was just me. And I was doing a lot of his role in managing the client base and managing the bookkeeping team as well as everything else in the business. And we didn't have the resources to hire other people to help with non-client work. So I was really under pressure work-wise. And then we had a lot of client work that was a little bit behind. So I was actually having to help with that and get in and, and help the bookkeeping team with bookkeeping work. And we also were under some cash flow pressure, which related to, and I had to dig in to understand why. And, and that was partly because we had some jobs that weren't priced right. And so I had to go, go back and re-scope a number of jobs. And then we had jobs where we just weren't doing them efficiently. So we had to really look at how we were doing it and could we be doing the bookkeeping work better. And then we also had the team was a bit bloated. So we had 14, a team of 14, and we weren't ready for that. And it was a lot of casual and, and part-time or contract workers who weren't doing many hours. And so we spent a lot of, they had a lot of overhead management and admin time that, again, it's not profitable. And so I had to deal with all of these issues and I needed to deal with them quickly so that we could improve our cash flow and so that I could start to pay myself. The, the business would have been 18 months old at this time and I was spending a lot of time, more than a full, more than full-time hours in B-Ninjas and I'd really cut back on my consulting business. So I really needed to improve cash flow so that I could pay myself a, a decent wage too to cover my living costs. And so there was the pressure of that, but also making difficult decisions like staff changes is also emotional too. And it took me longer than I thought to be able to, these changes all had to be made gradually. And the good news is you made the changes and they must have worked because here we are now in July of 2016 and you are still doing really well. We're going to talk about sort of the space between then and now in our next episode. We're going to talk about your journey to um, reaching for 1 million MRR and kind of cover your first three years. So thank you so much for sharing this information with me, Meryl. It's been really interesting. It's insight that I don't think we get very often. You know, we find out when someone's leaving a company through a general press release and there's kind of these canned responses that you get where, yeah, I enjoyed my time there and it was great and goodbye. Um, but it's nice to hear that it can be done with respect and where it doesn't negatively impact the business or your team. And it's really cool to hear that you and Ben are still partnering on certain things um, like you did last week. So that's really cool. Um, I am looking forward to our next episode. I want to get more into the growth that you've had since that 18 month mark. Um, are there any last minute sort of tips you would give to entrepreneurs, co-founders that are listening today that know that difficult conversation is coming up and they're struggling with even getting it started? What are your recommendations? I, I have a recommendation, which is even before that, is when you're picking a business partner, I think it's important to think about do you think how do you think they would handle a conversation like this so in the tough times and are they going to be respectful and and try and do things in both of your best interests and think about that at the beginning because it's likely that any kind of business partner or co-founder at some point it's going to end and so you need to have confidence that the person you're choosing to work with would handle that situation respectfully and well and i you may, when you're picking co-founders, not, not be considering that. You may be looking at their technical skills or their network or what they're bringing to the business. Sure. But I actually think evaluate your potential business partners from that point of view too. And then obviously having a documented, documented co-founder agreement, which we've talked about. And then I think raising the conversation early. So if you're not happy with what's happening, then... I think it's important to bring that to the table, not in a confrontational way, but just to be transparent with your business partner about how you're feeling and why. And, and in hindsight, that may be something that I didn't do early enough. And 
I, I, yeah, de definitely recommend being clear about how you're feeling because your business partner, they may be feeling the same way or they may not even be aware of or have considered what, what you've talked about and they may want to make changes in line, based on what you've said. Absolutely. Great advice from a really good source. You've been there, done that, and you did it well. You weathered the storm. Your business is still successful. So definitely information and advice worth listening to. I look forward to talking to you on our next podcast, Meryl. Thank you everyone for joining us. This is the Bean Ninjas podcast. That's the episode this week, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am your host, Elizabeth Powers, joined with my co-host, Meryl Johnston. We have so much fun sharing all of the insights and inside information with you. Don't forget to join us every week on the podcast. In the meantime, check out the show notes for links to any of the interesting conferences, blogs, books, etc. that we mention on each episode. And... If you just can't get enough of Bean Ninjas, check out the blog, beanninjas.com slash blog. Thank you so much and come back next week for another episode.